Hindustan Unilever performs a tad better than expectations with inline volume growth, but the stock slip on likely profit taking after a recent run up. Bajaj Finance sees healthy uh, income growth, but margins crimp and credit cost spikes, leading to a dip in the stock on concerns on asset as concerns on asset quality rise. While the finance secretary suggests withdrawal of indexation along with a tax cut should be positive, some in industry defer. The impact is expected to be positive for some, but negative for others. Hello and welcome to Halftime Report on uh, CNBC TV 18. I'm Ekta Batra and it's turning out to be a session where we are seeing some amount of mid-cap outperformance which is really taking place in today's trading session. So that seems to be the key point uh, uh, for today that yes, there is sentiment which is soured after the LTCG as well as the short-term capital gains tax. But the markets are seem to be making their peace with it at this point in time. So the bank nifty is underperforming. It's down around 1.2%. We have the mid caps which are up around 0.8% with an advanced decline ratio which is positive as well at this point. I just want to point out that you know one particular sector which was really outperforming yesterday which is the nifty FMCG index is seeing profit booking in today's trading session. So do watch out for that because yes uh, courtesy HUL, but nonetheless, that particular index is under pressure. And uh, the realty index, the BSE realty index, which uh, was under pressure in yesterday's trading session, is seeing some amount of consolidation today. So that's uh, something to note. But nonetheless, as of now, wait and watch. And I think it's back to earnings, considering that we have LNT, Axis, Federal Bank, all of these numbers to reckon with today. It's back to earnings. And, uh, you know, one would look at the market today right now and say that. Was there even a budget yesterday? <laughs> because uh, the way the market has seen resilience in the last couple of trading sessions, and not just that, over the last few months itself, it's uh, remarkable. But right now, at higher levels, we are facing some resistance, and that's uh, largely because of the Nifty Bank. The Nifty Bank has been the pressure point for the market for the last many months. And now, if you look at it, you know, down almost 600 points, it's the one index which is actually below yesterday's low as well. Yesterday's low on the Nifty Bank was closer to 51,340 thereabouts. And from there itself, we've broken below that. So 51,000 is an important mark to watch out for. And like you spoke about the broader markets, not only the FNO stocks, a lot of cash stocks doing extremely well. And some of them led by volumes uh, and earnings as well. Case in point, when we started the show, we had uh, at the bottom of your screen, numbers coming in from Go Fashion, a 16% revenue growth improvement in their EBITDA. And there's a 9% 9 uh, you know, stock price increase just on the back of those numbers itself, now settling at around 8%. So big move out there. And then some com good numbers coming in from the likes of United Spirits, etc. That was up around 6% in yesterday's, uh, today after yesterday's numbers too. Just on that point, you know, we've gone through an election. We've yep. gone through the fact that it's been a coalition verdict. And this is from a tweet that I read randomly. And now we have uh, LTCG and STCG, which has been uh, raised. But who would have thought the Nifty is still at around 24,000? We can say we are resilient at this point in time. We've given stupendous returns uh, from the whole of last year. So we need to keep that into, uh, you know, keep that in mind when we talk about the markets on a larger level. Absolutely. We take that point completely. I mean, uh, the kind of flows that have been coming in from retail investors, the SIP flows, etc. Month after month, we tell you the last three months, they have been upwards of 20,000 crores per month as well. So all of that working for the market, putting a bit of a lid at the lower level. And let's see where that goes from here as well. But like we pointed out, it's earnings that are most important from an equity return standpoint and over the long term, that's what matters. So let's talk about earnings itself. DCM Shriram is the first management on the show. Reported a good set of first quarter FI25 numbers after some quarters of underperformance. They witnessed strong margin expansion. The chemical segment revenue jumped 18%. So to discuss this and more, we have with us Amit Agarwal, who's the ED and Group CFO of the company, joining us now. Thanks a lot, Amit. Always a pleasure speaking with you. You know, first up, let's talk about uh, the outlook for this year itself. I mean, you've had a good start to the first, uh, I mean, the first quarter has been a good start. What's your overall outlook for the year across all the segments and margins in terms of revenue growth and margins, if you could give us a sense? See, for the, for the year as a whole, uh, we expect, you know, on the cost side, what we've seen in the Q1 as well, that the major benefit that has come has come primarily because of the costs. The costs have come down. And we expect the costs to remain stable going forward as well. 
So we do expect that uh, vis-a-vis last year, our performance should be better uh, this year. Okay. So can you just quantify that when you say that your performance will be better as compared to last year? Give us some numbers. What are you working with? So it is difficult uh, uh, to give the exact numbers given the kind of businesses we are in. That is point number one. Because you know there are multiple factors which are not in our control in terms of prices and even in terms of some of the inputs. Uh, and also, you know, the expansions that we are doing, you know, two of our expansions have come online in, in Q1 and two more will come online between Q2 and early Q3. That will also add, but it will also depend on, you know, how we are able to ramp up and things like that. So that gives me confidence that we should have a better year. But in terms of quantifying, it will be a little difficult. All right, so let's just, talk about... Okay. Yeah. Just just to follow up on that, uh, FI24, you saw a decline in terms of revenue. Your margins were 9% versus 14%. While you can't quantify numbers, um, you know, and you can't quantify it, are you going to see a you know significant amount of growth this this time round? Is it going to be higher than single digits? If you can give us a range in terms of what the single digit growth would be, if that's the case, and if in case there is a margin improvement, do you get back to FY23 levels or do you improve from FY24 levels? Give us a ballpark of what we can expect. So uh, we will definitely improve from the FY24 levels. And I am also, I can also see that it won't be FY23 levels. It will be lower than that. So FY23 was, uh, I would say, a windfall gain where all commodities were through the roof. So I don't expect that to happen. So we'll be lower than FY23, better than FY24. All right. That gives us a sense. Let's talk about individual segments now because you spoke about a bunch of segments. The chemicals business, that led to the growth in the first quarter. So we wanted to understand the cycle, where we are in the cycle. I mean, do you foresee improvement, further improvement here from what we saw in the first quarter? And, uh, you know, the higher volumes, 18%, that was lower uh, offset by lower prices. Where do you see this volume price mix uh, be towards the end of this year? So we have seen prices improving. So my sense is that prices have bottomed out, what we saw in Q4 of last year. So prices have bottomed out. Uh, they should be stable to improving is what our estimate is. But, you know, these are commodity businesses, so, you know, it's very difficult to give us exact sense on that. Uh, but what is more important for us are two things. One, uh, what's happening on the cost side. So the energy prices are lower. So unless an uh, event, global event happens, which, you know, rakes up these prices, we are confident that our costs will remain low. So we have seen almost 20-25% dip in our uh, variable costs. So that is important. The other thing which is important for us is what's happening on our growth. The projects that uh, under were under implementation now they are uh, getting on track so two of the expansion projects are already in place as i mentioned two new products are coming on track in you know the first half of the year and that is what is going to drive growth for the business okay uh can you give us a sense in terms of the sugar margins and the segment there the margins continue to be under pressure uh would a possible demerger be on the cards See, in terms of uh, sugar margins, a lot of it is policy-driven, right? Hmm. Now, uh, there were two policies which impacted us. One was on the increase in cane price uh, for the UP, which led to higher yeah. cost of production. And the selling price increase was not commensurate with hmm. the increase in uh, costs. That was one which impacted the margins. The other was that the exports of sugar was banned. Now, that led to a volume impact as well as a margin impact. So, these are the two key reasons why, you know, sugar did underperform versus the same period last year. But given that we have uh, uh, this uh, ethanol business, I think that has been stable. We had better volumes. That business is doing good. Now, to your question on uh, demerger, I think that's a decision which uh, we definitely talk about internally in the management. Board will take a call at the appropriate time. Right. Uh, we'll ask you to just hold on to your thoughts. Uh, we'll come back to you and discuss about uh, your numbers in just a bit because at the bottom of your screen, again, we have numbers flashing in. It's earnings season. So these are numbers coming in from Bajaj FinServ where the total income has grown about 35%. We've seen net profit grow by about 10% as well. Of course, uh, on a consolidated basis, it would include the numbers of Bajaj Finance, which were reported yesterday already as a result of which that stock is lower too. But as of now, the two details that we have right now, Total income growth of about 35%, close to around 31,480 crores on the top line. The bottom line increased by about 10%. That stock lower by about 2%. We'll 
dip into these numbers once again as and when we have more details perhaps when the presentation is uploaded to the exchanges as well. Let's get back to our conversation with uh, the management of DCM Shridam. Uh, you know, I wanted your thoughts on uh, two things. One, you said that uh, there is CapEx coming in uh, towards the end of this year. Is it the same one as uh, the epoxy raisin and downstream products where you had earlier indicated that the asset turns could be around 1.5 to 2 times? This was 1,000 crore CapEx. Is this the one? If yes, then maybe then, you know, the next financial year looks a lot better for you, FI26 that is. So what I am talking about is on uh, the feedstock for epoxy, which is epichlorohydrine. That project is coming up in this financial year. And hydrogen peroxide. These are the projects which are very near to commissioning. As far as epoxy is concerned, that is about two years away. And, and, and the advanced intermediary is one? Pardon me? The advanced intermediary is one? Yes, so advanced materials, which is epoxy, that is about hmm. two years away. Uh, but All the right. performance, as I mentioned, uh, you know, with these projects coming up where we have increased our caustic capacity, epichlorohydrine, we, have, we will be amongst the largest player, the second largest in the country, or, the, you know, at par with the largest in the country. Similarly, hydrogen peroxide. So, I think as the capacity ramps up, our uh, years going forward should be much better for the chemicals business. So, follow up on uh, the sugar business, because you said the policy impacted your margins. A lot of the sugar companies are increasing their, uh, you know, contribution coming in from ethanol and that is actually making them a lot more immune to these policy related changes as well. What has your growth here been? What is your contribution from ethanol right now? What is it likely to be? What are the plans here to de-risk the sugar business from this policy change? So see, we started our ethanol journey somewhere in 2017-2018. Hmm. And uh, we are fully integrated as far as ethanol is concerned. We've also added capacities which are on grain-based. So we have total of close to about 550, 560 kiloliters per day kind of a capacity, which is pretty decent. We produce close to about 18 crores liters of uh, ethanol annually. So I think we are pretty well integrated. Now, the growth will be on two fronts for the sugar business. One is on ethanol, but I think that requires some policy support from the government in terms of feedstock and more so uh, with the, uh, the the grain-based feedstock. Now, how that how does that uh, pan out? Because we've seen ad hoc announcements uh, which uh, derail, you know, the the uh, prospects of investing in a grain-based distillery. That is one. Uh, second, I think is uh, what we are looking at is you know sugar is one part of the business. How do we grow other parts of uh, the business in terms of where we can utilize sugar to the maximum in other products? For example, mm. we have gotten into sulfate of potash, we are getting into CBG, and we're looking at more. So it will be like de-risking the business. So that's our thought process on sugar going forward. Okay, all right, uh, Amit, we're going to leave it on that note. Thanks very much for joining in and speaking with us. So that's DCM Shriram. That stock is higher by around 0.8%. Just want to pull up uh, Bajaj FinServe again, because remember that it is basically Bajaj Finance plus the general insurance as well as the life insurance business, which equals to Bajaj FinServe. So for the life insurance and general insurance business, just want to point out in terms of revenue, life insurance has done around 5,000 odd crores this quarter. And uh, the uh, segment, the PBT has come in at around 183 odd crores. And it, when it comes to the general insurance business, it's come in at around 4,760 odd crores in terms of revenue. And the PBT has come in at around 569 odd crores, which is higher both year on year as well as uh, Q on Q. For life insurance, it's lower Q on Q, but higher on a uh, year on year basis when it comes to the profit before tax. So that's just a basic detail on Bajaj Finser. We'll get you more details on that once uh, more details filter through from the investor. Uh, presentation. We'll take a short break, but up next we'll touch base with another company that came out with its numbers uh, this week. We have Polymedicure, which is in focus. Himanshu Baird, who's the MD, will join in to discuss the company's performance.
Welcome back. Uh, well, for the markets, the mid-cap index up around 8 tenths of a percent. The advanced decline ratio is still holding in the green. So that's a positive that we can see. The Nifty PSC index is doing well today. So that one is up around 1.1 percent. So do watch out for that, giving the mid-cap index company. But let's talk about one particular company that did release its numbers on Monday. Uh, it reported what was a good set of numbers. Um, both revenue and EBITDA were healthy to discuss this and the impact of the custom duty cut on X-ray tubes, flat panel uh, detectors. We have with us Himanshu Baird, who is the MD of the company, joining in. Uh, Mr. Baird, thank you very much for taking the time out. Let's start with a steady growth of around 20-odd percent, which you've been reporting you know, for multiple quarters now. Uh, just break it up for us this quarter. How much did you grow in the domestic business? How much did you grow in exports? Because you've said that traditionally what you've seen in the past few quarters is that domestic is underperforming exports. Was that the case this quarter, the growth rate and your guidance? Yeah, I think uh, you're right. So still export is actually doing very well. And uh, we have grown over 25% in exports. Uh, but domestic has kind of underperformed. We are in that 6-7% range. But I think when we look at, uh, we break domestic into two parts. So we have, let's say, a government business, and then we have, you know, uh, let's say, a trade business. So trade business has done very well. That has grown by around 20%. But there was a decline in government business by around 30 to 40%. And the main reason was that few products which we had uh, last year, we have discontinued some products which were supplying to government. And that is the main reason we saw a negative growth. But uh, we are we are pretty much confident that the domestic business will also come back to track, you know, with that 20% growth rate overall in next coming quarters. Give us the growth rates for this quarter. Uh, say again. Could you just give us a segmental breakup this quarter? Yeah, so uh, in, when we look at the segments, uh, you know, renal has done very well. So renal business has grown by around 40% overall. And uh, our vascular business has also grown by around 20, 25% in that range. So we, we are seeing a good growth in, in the existing and the new businesses we have started. Only one business which didn't do well was the government segment. And I think uh, we are not very focused there. So hopefully the numbers will no normalize in the next few quarters. All right. What about, uh, you know, exports and domestic? What did they grow at? Uh, what are they likely to grow at this year? How much is government as an overall, uh, you know, contributor to your overall sales? What happened to that? And again, Renal, you said it's grown 20, 25 percent. What's the absolute number here? So, uh, uh, Renal, we have done a revenue of 30, 30 crores plus in the first okay. quarter. And we have guided for between 140 to 150 crores this year for Renal revenue from 90 crores in the previous year. And when we look at the export growth rate, I think we will see export growing around close to 25 percent plus in the full year and maybe domestic business grows around close to around 22 to let's say 24 percent so overall again we we stay with our guidance of 22 to 24 percent which have you know you know told in the beginning of the year so i think we are on track uh, for that uh, you know revenue guidance okay so fi 25 growth should be 20 to 22 percent is that correct uh, the total growth should be between 22 and 24 percent. That is what 22 we to 24 percent. And what about right. the margins? Because that's improved, um, you know, Q on Q. You've done 27 uh, percent. Yeah. What resulted in this margin improvement? Was it better realizations in exports? And what are you guiding for? See, again, margin, uh, if you remember, Ikta, we had talked about, you know, 100 to 150 pips improvement in the beginning of the year. So I think we, we continue with that guidance. And I think, uh, of course, we see attraction better margins and exports. But I think uh, our new product ranges in cardio and critical care are also you know, coming up well because we are launching 8 to 10 products in each category right now. So they will also help us to improve margins uh, going forward in the year. So I think we will stay with that number of 100 to 150 pips. So uh, we should continue with that. Yeah, board had okayed, uh, you know, uh, given you an approval to raise about 800 crores via QIP. Just wanted to know What's the update on that? Uh, this board approval came back in March. Now yeah. we're in the month of July. By when do you plan to raise this? So we had taken a new approval uh, because the initial approval was for, you know, uh, uh, let's say QIP or preferential or debt. So finally, the final approval was taken in end of June uh, for a QIP. And we have now, uh, you know, gone back to the shareholders and waiting for the shareholders approval. Hopefully this should come in early August. 
And after that, I think by third to fourth week of August, we should be able to do our fundraise. Okay. And this is for 800 crore itself, right? Yeah, that is between up to 1,000 crores. So, but the final number has not been decided, but we'll decide it closer to the, to the date. Okay. Uh, what are the funds going to be used for? So mainly for uh, you know new plants, we are we are planning to set up some new plants. So mm -hmm. that is where so so the existing uh, capex we are doing right now from our uh, internal approach is, is happening in the existing plants, and we are ramping up capacity in the existing plants. But for the new projects, we are looking at around three to four new plants to be set up in next 24 months, and uh, the new capex and the fundraise will go there. Okay. Well, I just have two questions and I'm going to ask you to be brief on them. For the U.S. business, have you already started supplying? Because I understand that there was some approval from the U.S. FDA for certain devices. Yes, we we have started shipments in Q2. With, with most, the first shipment goes in Q2 this year. So in next a few weeks from now. And we've already got four approvals and 8 to 10 are in pipeline right now. So what are these two uh, devices which you will be supplying to the U.S.? So base, basically covering the infusion uh, category, infusion product, the vascular access category, which is our core business, uh, you know, that is where we are going to start selling in the U.S. market. Okay. And how much do you expect to make from it? See, I think uh, we have given a guidance for that three to four year guidance of 15, 20 million dollars. So we'll stay with that because the ramp up will take time. But I think uh, the start has already happened. So I think that is more important for us. And what about the margins? Margins, I think we should stay in that range, uh, you know, what we have been telling. So I can't specifically talk about US right now because it's just an initial start. But I think in the next few quarters, I'll be able to give a better visibility. Okay, just quickly, I wanted to ask you about the budget. Uh, you hmm. know, these uh, basic customs duty on X-ray tubes and flat panel detectors, it goes into the eventual making of X-rays. Those are the components which yeah. where the customs duty is reduced. Uh, tell us how much was the customs duty, how much is it reduced to, and why are we not producing these indigenously? See, I think the, the biggest problem was that, you know, it has come under, under the phase manufacturing program. And under phase manufacturing program, the duty was increased for finished products. Uh, I think it's close to around 20% now for finished products. And for the components, it was still higher. And it was actually, and some of these are, you know, very critical devices which are manufactured by very few companies in the world. So the government decided to reduce the duty on parts and components so that the manufacturing in India becomes more competitive. And I think it's part of that. So, uh, you know, but I think overall the medtech industry still uh, benefits from lower duty on uh, on parts and component raw material through a special exemption. And I think that is actually pushing more manufacturing in the country. So I think that, that we are grateful for the government that they're continuing with that you know, lower duty for raw material and parts. All right, take that point. Thank you so much uh, for joining in and giving us uh, the view on the business and the outlook going ahead. 42% is uh, what we've seen in terms of a stock price move over the last six months. Uh, let's see at what point, uh, you know, you do come out with a fundraising plan of yours. We'll wait until the end of August. The size and issue price of uh, the QIP that you're talking about is something we'll keep an eye out on. Close to around 20 to 24 percent growth in this year is what the management of Polymedicure is guiding for this year. Take a short break, come back, focus on the markets. Pritesh Mehta joins in with some trading strategies. Well, between going into break and now, there has been one sharp decline in the market and that decline has been led by the Nifty Bank itself. When we started the show, the Nifty Bank was a little over 51,100. Now it's below that 51,000 mark. The reason why this 51,000 mark is extremely important is because there was a fair amount of put writing at that 51,000 mark itself. In fact, the Nifty Bank active options should come up for you. Nifty Bank is now way below yesterday's low on the budget and now we have the 51,000 put. Had an open interest of almost 40 lakh shares, 
premium of 275 rupees. So levels below 51,000, closer to 50,700, 50,800 should be a support. If it falls below that, then maybe we are in for a rough ride on the Nifty Bank in particular. On the way up, 51,000 call writers, they would be, you know, uh, laughing their way off to the banks right now. Those who would have written that call because of the big decline that we've seen in the call price itself. 650 rupees is the decline that we saw in the premium from yesterday is close on the nifty bank 51000 call as a result of which the nifty 2 has fallen below 24400 in fact 24450 call writers were all the way uh, hoping for that 24500 mark to be a bit of a resistance that's exact exactly what the high on the day was for the nifty but now the lower level the 24400 call writers are coming in lower and the 24400 put writers too are very active we have seen some writing out there those guys would now be underperforming and uh, unwinding their positions so everyone's hoping for some support to come by around 24300 24350 somewhat where we are right now the outperformance of the mid cap index perhaps may lead to some bit of an improvement in uh, the markets right now a belief that maybe there could be support at lower levels it is a very very stock specific market so we are seeing a lot of action in uh, individual stocks and in the expiry week, maybe something like a Vodafone idea and Piramal Enterprises may enter the FNO ban, whereas sale would exit FNO ban. So the mid cap index is still outperforming. The markets have seen a big decline led by the Nifty Bank. Nifty Bank closer to support zones, as is the Nifty. If we hold on here, great. If not, then maybe the second half could be a bit rough. Okay, all right, Bangnam, thanks uh, very much for that. So those are a couple of more details which are trickling in from Bajaj Finser. We'll probably get Abhishek in to talk more about the details. But uh, as of now, we have Pritesh Mehta joining in from Yes Securities to discuss uh, the technicals of the market. Pritesh, hi, welcome to the show. Uh, if you could just start by giving us a sense in terms of a couple of these insurance stocks which are in focus, HDFC Life, SBI Life are higher. Uh, HDFC Life, in fact, is the top gainer right now. And uh, now we have Bajaj Finser, which is in focus as well. Technically, how are you approaching them? See, in fact, it was uh, in the insurance space, you know, it was one of my pick, trading picks because, you know, we have created customized insurance index and that has been moving higher. That has given a fresh break on the upside. So Bajaj Finser, HDFC Life, SBI Life and, and so many names are part of the index. And, and, and I, the way I look into it, Bajaj Finzer has been underperformer. We are not expected uh, the stock to participate in the upside. Recently, it had a move to, uh, on the upside. It went uh, on the upside to 60, 60 or levels, but it failed to sustain. So it continues to be underperformer. So rather than sticking to the stock which is underperforming, we should we should uh, be with the stock which is uh, outperforming or, or the leader of, the, of this particular index. And that particular stock is ICCI, uh, uh, I, uh, sorry, LICI. In fact, uh, LICI, uh, it, is, it has given a big base record of last six months. On the point of figure chart, we are talking about a bullish turtle breakout coming in. I'm expecting a stock, this stock to move towards 400 levels in the next couple of months. All right. Uh, so that's uh, the view coming in on AIC. But uh, on the index itself, what is your call? We've seen a big decline closer towards support zones right now. Do you think we break down from here? Or maybe there is a case for some bit of recovery from here, especially given the outperformance of the mid-cap index? So Mangala, a, a drop of 0.5% does not really matter much <laughs> at, the, at this point of time in index. But the way I'm looking into it, we are likely to go through a period of time-wise correction. See, we have seen a good amount of rally last few months, but I know a bit of time-wise correction is required, uh, especially when I look at the pocket of strength emerging, that, uh, you know, that is in IT space, that is FNG space, banks and financials continuously declining in last uh, three odd weeks. So I think focus would shift uh, towards this particular space where there is strength, but IT uh, and uh, but uh, financials and uh, bank would be the underperforming that laggards uh, going forward. But as far as index is concerned, nothing much big. Uh, you know, I'm expecting on the downside. In fact, we could see. I think next few weeks could be a period of sideways correction. Okay. All right, uh, Pratish, we're going to let you go on that note. Thanks uh, very much for taking the time out. We'll. Take a break, but up next we have another company to focus on. New Gen Software will be joining in to discuss the quarter contracts.
Welcome back. Uh, well, let's get talking to another company now. Newgen Software is the next management on the show. The revenue and EBITDA have come in quite strong to discuss this. We have with us Virendra Jeet, who's the CEO of uh, the company joining in. Virendra, thank you very much uh, for taking the time out. Well, Q1 is generally typically the weakest uh, quarter for a company such as yours. Uh, so revenue growth has been strong at around 25% year on year. Uh, can you tell us what were the key drivers? Good afternoon, Ekta, and thank you for having me on your channel. As you're right, uh, Q1 is a lean quarter for us. But having said that, for we have been growing continuously for last uh, eight quarters, Y on Y, at about 25%. And I think in that, it has been in line to that growth. So there's no surprise from us in terms of we did expect to grow. And in fact, our expectation was to slightly have a better quarter than this. Uh, the growth is coming from our core traditional markets. We are very strong in India, Middle East, and APAC. And U.S. is typically a market where we still are established. So financial services have been a great uh, customer. Again, uh, the wins in that sector have been great. We got a broad-based growth. I think we got wins in Middle East. We got wins in India. We got wins in our Southeast Asia market. And also we did a good amount of, you know, uh, kind of a penetration in U.S. market. We had a large deal in banking out there as well. So it has been a broad-based growth. It is, it's a continued story. Uh, we have been on a, a run for last eight to ten quarters with a high growth rate and I think we will try to continue that momentum going forward. All right, uh, fairly optimistic. You will try to continue that momentum at 25%. You said that you thought that you could have done better. So let's uh, pin you down to that itself. Uh, what exactly is what, we, what uh, you're expecting for the entire year in terms of revenue growth? And if you could break that down, you said, you know, India, APAC, uh, EMEA and US is uh, are the core geographies. I remember the last time you said that you are looking to increase your exposure in the US itself. So if you could give us a sense of the revenue growth for this year that you're gunning for, and in that, break that down across all geographies. See, as I said that, I think we would like to keep the historical momentum going, and I don't see any challenges in the businesses of right now. Our traditional markets, as I said, are continue to grow, they continue to show grow, strong momentum. India and Middle East are going to be the leading growth drivers. I think if you look at last year also, we have almost grown between 35 to 40% in these two geos. We do expect them to grow at a high growth rate. To be exact on numbers, you know, it's very difficult. We still are a company with a, with a small base of revenue. We are we just covered uh, th around 11 or 1200 crores last year. So I think uh, single deals in quarters do vary in terms of numbers. So it's still advised to look at this company at a more annual basis in terms of revenue. Having said that, as you rightly said, I think India, Middle East, and APAC will continue to grow. US, we are very optimistic. A lot of our investments in terms of our core marketing, as well as our building sales and our support structures is happening in US. We recently mm. pivoted our strategy to go to really larger accounts in US rather than smaller accounts. And so it's taking a bit of time. But having said that, as I rightly said, we did have wins in Q1 and we do expect that in Q2, Q3 will continue to have the wins out there. Okay. So when you talk about maybe a quarterly run rate in terms of the US, can you just provide us a sense in terms of what it might be? Uh, you did around 70 odd crores in terms of revenue this quarter. Would that be a run rate that we can assume will continue for the next couple of quarters for the US considering that you are more, you know, there's a more promising deal uh, win? No, I think it will expand as because quarterly our revenue does expand because as I said, it's slightly lopsided revenue Q1, Q2 being leaner quarters. So we do expect it to, not only we expect it to, uh, you know, increase because of the lopsidedness, but also we expect growth out there. We always, uh, at least at the beginning of the year, we are gunning more than 20% growth in the U.S. as well. Where we exactly hit, uh, I think that may be, you know, some amount of time before we discover that. But we are very optimistic by Q3, Q4, we should be able to expand our U.S. sales. and We should be able to really bring it at, as one of the growth territories as India and Middle East. Just, uh, just but let me you just... know, before the results come, we'll have to wait for that results. But we are quite okay. optimistic. Let me just rephrase that. Uh, 70.5 crores. Uh, the maximum you did was around 75 crores in Q4 of FI23 in the past couple of quarters. And the lowest has been around uh, 62.4 crores. So give us an average run rate that we can expect. Are you now comfortably above 70 crores per quarter? Yeah, so what happens is, you know, a large part of our business is typically annuity and more subscription based. So roughly around 70-80% of business is more predictable at the beginning of the year. So this kind of a momentum of 70 crores can continue. And, uh, you know, even if we don't have any wins for the year. But we don't expect that. We do expect that this, this to expand over the year. 
for the remaining quarters of the year. All right. Um, you know, what about your order book? Uh, what is the current order book that you're standing on? You said that there are a bunch of deal wins that you've, ta uh, you've seen in the first quarter. You're hopeful of some more. So what does your order book currently stand at? What do you anticipate it to be, you know, over the next couple of quarters? Yes, yeah, so I, actually I don't have exact numbers of order book because our business is typically, you know, around, you know, for next year's growth, almost 90% of the revenue comes from existing clients, clients. And a lot of that is around renewals of order book. So order book is not the right reflection. But having said that, last year at the end of the year, I think we had roughly around 20% growth in the order book size on an annual basis. On quarterly, I'm not sure about the numbers, but we can share that. Yes. Uh, so, you know, we are there. But order books, you know, because the, the business is a bit lumpy on the license deal. So finally, mm. the Q3, Q4 license revenue will determine the larger growth numbers for the company. And that is how we expect, you know, this year to also perform that. All right. So let's wrap it up then with your margin profile. Uh, first quarter, again, typically on the lowest side, then you see big acceleration as we move towards the end of this year. This year, on a year-on-year -year basis, there has been about 300 basis points improvement. What are you gunning for for the entire year? See, as I said that, you know, previously, I see we are a high gross margin business. A large part of our revenue has got no direct costs. You know, it's around, at, we are at 65 to 68% gross margin business. We do spend a lot on our R&D and sales and marketing. But as a, as a healthy practice, we always gun to have roughly around 20% of net margin and 23% of a beta margin. Beyond this, any expansion, we would like to invest in growth. Having said that, in a shorter period of time, if a revenue really shoots up, we cannot really reinvest that in the same year. So, but you know, we would always tend to be around those numbers, but on a particular quarter or a year, it could expand, but the intent is to really push for growth and still expand our growth. Okay, all right. Uh, well, we're gonna leave it on that note. Thanks very much for joining in and speaking with us. So that's the management of Nugent, but we do have Federal Bank, which is on your num on your screen. Net profit has come in at around 1,000-odd crores, and that is versus our poll of 946-odd crores, so that's better than what we were expecting. NII has come in, um, you'd have to say, largely in line, 2,292-odd crores versus our expectations of 2,283-odd crores. Net NPA, absolutely stable, 0.6% compares to 0.6% uh, on a sequential basis. And the gross NPA, I think, was a little above 2% on a Q1Q basis, I think largely maintained on a uh, sequential basis for the, um, for the gross NPA as well. Obviously, the devil lies in the details for you know all of the banks with the investor presentation, the details on the asset quality, the net interest margins, which should probably come in soon along with the other details uh, such as you know the, the the credit growth etc going forward will what we we'll, uh, which is what we'll wait for but as of now as you can see there's a little uptick which is taking place on the absolute basis when it's coming on the gross npa but on a ratio basis i think it's just been a marginal move up yeah but nothing really nothing to worry about that. because you know uh, the loan growth for the company they have their business update as well that was the highest that we saw in the last seven quarters deposits grew by about 19.6 percent year on year as well and uh, this is a momentous quarter for the company as well because this is the last time where Sham Srinivasan chairs uh, the, the company, the, the meeting and the board itself. The one number that the, the street would be looking out for would be the slippage number because there are estimates ranging anywhere between 400 crores to around 550 crores. So that is something that one, one will watch out for because this is a number that can rise quarter on quarter. And uh, asset quality, you know, most on the street were anticipating no change. So net NPA has seen no and change, even as gross NPA has increased a little. And generally, you never see a change, you know, when uh, Federal Bank reports in terms of the net NPA as well as the gross NPA is stable uh, for a lot of these banks. But really, the details are when the management starts talking and, you know, the investor presentation comes out. That's when the real details come out for a lot of these banks. And that's when, the you know, the market decides whether they like the numbers or not. Take a short break then. On that note, uh, we'll let the market decide as uh, we chew on those numbers that, we, that are there and as we await more details. Come back on the other side, we'll focus on all the other stocks which are moving around.
Welcome back. Uh, well, Thyrocare is one stock which is doing very well today. Revenues and margins have come in at a multi-quarter high in Q1 and that's the reason why you're seeing a double-digit gain coming in on Thyrocare. So that stock should come up for you up around 14% uh, for Thyrocare as you can see. But Federal Bank is the big talking point at this point. Abhishek is here with the details. Abhishek. Uh, well, other income and uh, lower employee expenses have led a beat uh, with respect to PAT uh, versus Apple. So if you take a look, the other income is up 21.4% sequentially. The employee expenses, that's declined by 16.8% quarter on quarter. And that's led to a PAT beat of close to 6.7% versus Apple. So they have reported a PAT of 1,009 crore. Uh, we are working with a number of 946 crore. Asset quality seen some deterioration over here. Gross NPI has increased increased by 4.6 percent net NPA has increased by uh, close to 5.98 percent that is close to 6 percent but as a ratio gross NPA ratio is the lowest that you are seeing for federal bank in last nine years or 36 quarters so gross NPA ratio is at 2.11 percent versus uh, 2.13 percent in the previous quarter ROA has remained stable at 1.28 percent which is the same that they recorded in Q1 of FI24 as well operationally it's a good quarter for them However, the net interest margin has declined to 3.16%. We, we uh, I mean, analysts were expecting a flat net interest margin. So, a uh, small decline in net interest margin. But operationally, it looks like a strong set of numbers with respect to profitability. Back to you. All right, Abhishek, you know, we are also getting fresh slippages uh, at the bottom of your screen as we speak with you. Fresh slippages at 424 crores. This compares with 371 crores. The street was expecting some bit of a spike quarter on quarter, but 424 crores would largely be in line with what the analysts were expecting. Uh, well, yes, seasonal in nature, you know, any bank, if you see uh, Q1 uh, slippages do spike up due to agri uh, portfolio that the bankers do have. Now, just to alert our viewers, you know, some of the brokerages were working with a number of uh, 450 to 550 crore of slippages in Q1, but it has come in at 424 crore, so it is below the analyst estimate. Back to you. All right, take that point. Thank you so much, Abhishek, for joining in with that quick take on Federal Bank. Slip into a short break. Come back on the other side. Manisha Gupta joins in. Welcome back. You're joining us now is Sachin Jain from World Gold Council. Sachin, hi. With one slash in import duty from a 15 to 6 percent, government ensured that all that distorted duty structure that was in India is taken care of. Thanks, Manisha. Thanks for getting me on. And you're absolutely spot on. It's a truly a transformative moment for the gold business in India. And the steps that government has taken is uh, is really in the direction of what we call as Vixit Bharat, is in the direction of digital India, transparency and bringing inclusivity where every everybody who's following the rules of the game and doing things well you know get get uh, garnered with a lot of interest so it's it's a phenomenal step it's a great transformative stage in which indian gold industry will go through and a huge mm. welcome Sachin, the other thing that the industry is now uh, awaiting is the GST Council meeting and an expectation that with the duty cut now, the next thing that would happen is a GST increase in gold. How are you looking at this uh, balance and the conversation? Uh, Maisha, if you go back in time, when the GST uh, you know, was decided for our sector, it wasn't done by a drop of a hat. And I again duly respect the, uh, the, uh, the system that was formed at that point in time. The council was made, there were a lot of discussions and discussions panned out over a year as to what it meant for gold, what it meant for diamonds, what it meant for, you know, the industry at large. And even at that point, the government didn't take an ad hoc decision. And I'm I'm presuming the same system or the policy will be followed. So I don't foresee these things are immediately connected and we are really uh, anticipating a little quick uh, decision on it. But I don't think it's going to be the case. It's going to be duly thought of. The custom duty reduction is a very important step if you see... Uh, fundamentally eradicating the malpractices that were happening in the business. There was a whole difference of competitiveness that India had vis-a-vis -vis some other nations. I think it's a very important step for that thing. And I, I think we should recognize this, uh, this whole big step and the contention that the Indian government has taken. 
Absolutely. Sachin, so, uh, you know, a couple of things then. One, for consumers, uh, clearly it is a big buying opportunity. If, but if consumers bought it in the last week or last month, it clearly is that decline in their holding uh, on what they bought. But for the jewelers, and not, yes, not all of them hedge as much. I've been speaking to a lot of jewelers. Some are 30% hedged, some are 70% hedged as well. So there is a one-time hit that the markets will look into this one. Well, actually, Manisha, that's always been the, the sort of uh, rule of the game or sort of, uh, you know, how it happens. The fact is that when the uh, when the custom duty has gone upwards, also the, the benefit is uh, is received by the by the industry at large. But yes, uh, somebody is holding stock, and as you rightly said, a lot of uh, part of the industry is uh, working on hedged uh, gold. The other part is invested gold, and yes, there'll be a loss. However, if you see in mid to long term, and I've been in touch with most of the big jewelers as well. The fact is, this what it'll create is the fundamentals of the business will transform in the sense that if you just look at study deeply, the last quarter, particularly post Akshay the jewelry industry has, you know, it's been it's been a very tough uh, last 45 days to 50 days for the entire industry. Uh, on one hand, you had of course a dull time, but also on the other hand, very high prices of gold. Now, with yes. this, what it does is it truly in a right space. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, brings quality in the Indian pricing vis-a-vis -vis the, uh, the international pricing and uh, gives a big stir to the uh, demand mm -hmm. that will be generated by the end client. And I'm not talking it about over play, play, playing with the paper, but the true genuine Indian consumer who's we'll investing in buying gold, mm -hmm. you will be out there. And we foresee that so, uh, the, the next quarter, which is going to be largely B2B and preparation mm -hmm. for the festive will be strong. And we hopefully believe that quarter four, uh, like uh, calendar quarter four, uh, for Indian consumption point of view, will be a very, very strong quarter. That's exactly what my next question was, Sachin. Uh, so what is the kind of demand jump that you're seeing? I mean, as you said, B2B, yes, IRJS is what you're referring to. And then we will also see the wedding and the festival seasons begin in the month of August. So uh, until now, people anticipated higher value and perhaps not so much in sense of volume. But as you said, both of these perhaps could go hand in hand now with this correction in gold prices. So is there any percentage increase that you anticipate from the second half of last year? So, uh, from my perspective, Manisha, we had uh, anticipated that the consumption of gold in the year 2024 as calendar year would be in the range of 700 to 800. Now, that's quite a wide range. But why mm -hmm. we gave that range was that if there is, you know, uh, let's say a dramatic increase or up and down on pricing, that would be then it could be towards the lower spectrum. And if things are slightly more stable and, and slightly more proactive, then it would be on the upper end of the spectrum. Now, clearly with this step, if you look at what happened in the last quarter, where demand for investment products like uh, like coins and bars has was, was the highest ever. And next week, we'll be able to share with you more specific numbers. But those numbers are dramatic. Whereas on the other hand, the jewelry demand was very low. I mean, it had dropped uh, dramatically also as a combined with the, the, uh, the season and the pricing. We feel that the uh, interest in the investment demand will continue, whereas the consumption for jewelry, which was you know very very slow and almost declining, will uh, spur up. So combine okay. both of these things, we foresee that it, it's going to be strong, and hence we will cover up the uh, the drop that we witnessed in quarter two uh, of okay. this year, and eventually ending up at a good space uh, if you take the overall year average. All right. On that, hi. Thank you so much, Sachin, for joining us. So absolutely, thumbs up when it comes to jewelry as a sector and for the consumers as well with the kind of decline that we've seen in gold and silver prices. Overnight has been 4 to 5% of a cut and that exactly is what you benefit from in case you're buying that jewelry pieces today. But with that, it's wrap on Halftime Report. Business Lunch will take all the action forward.